Are we starting? Are we away? Okay. I've got four minutes. Fine, I'm going to make him wait. No, I'm not really. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, if you don't know, my name's Andy Valentine. I go by Valentine Costumes. I should have put it on my first slide. Um, go by Valentine Costumes. Um, and if you don't follow me on Instagram yet, you should, because I'm about to hit 3,000, and I'll be really disappointed if I don't hit it by the end of this weekend. Um, <laughs> if you find all this boring or you don't like, decide you don't like leather work on the way out, you want to take a business card of some on the end of my table, but you will go into a, a secret pile of people that I will despise forever. Um, first question, anyone ever use leather work for anything? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so not very many. Oh, yeah, of course you have. Um, yeah, okay, great. Um, and has that been, use, use like hard leather, like veg tan, like this kind of thing. Three more minutes. I'm going to wait. I'm gonna, if I don't wait, then I'll be told off. Go out as entered. No bias, but I quite like the woven armor. Right, I'm going to, I'll start that again. When we come back to this in a minute, if you could pretend that you haven't just heard the last 30 seconds and be equally hilarious, uh, that would be, <laughs> that'd be wonderful. I think I've got everything. I'm bound to have forgotten something. There's some bits I would love to do, but I'm not going to be able to do because either A, I'll break the table, or B, I'll score the table, and either one of those will get me. Do I have the needle? Which needle? I've got like 25 needles. I've got 147 pieces of equipment in here. You're not going to get introduced to all of them. Um, but if over the course of the weekend, anyone wants to know more about any of these tools or get a bit more of a hands-on with some of these, if you know where the cosplay guest stuff is, I will have it with me all of tomorrow, and I am about most of tomorrow. So I will happily like, take some time and talk with people through some of these different tools. So the plan today, oh yes, how to make a detailed and finished belt in, I forgot to update that, 12 steps. <laughs> Let's do <laughs> The first two steps aren't really steps, so really it's 10. So let's say it's Roman numerals. And god damn it. It's a great start. So what are those 10 steps going to be? One, picking your leather, cutting it, shaping, stroke wet forming it. We're not actually going to be doing that because we require a lot of water, but you'll see why surely. Edge grooving, beveling, swivel tooling. That's the best one, both in name and use. Hammer tooling is even better because you get to wear baggy MC hammer pants. Dyeing, antiquing, burnishing, punching and sewing is nothing to do with fighting your fabrics. <laughs> and finishing, that's finishing the leather, not the presentation, but they do happen to coincide. Um, so there, that's the X steps. So choosing your leather. So we've got a couple of people who've worked with leather before. So obviously there are a large varieties of leather you can use depending on what you want to use them for. So you might use a garment leather. So this is quite a popular one if you're going to make clothing or some like leather pants or you know, you know, the top of a piece of garment stuff. Tooling leather, veg tan, that is this stuff. This is the thick, hard stuff. Um, I'm going to keep this one on me. But well, unless you've never played with VegTan, feel free to pass that around. So VegTan is the kind of thing you use for belts. Um, it's generally speaking made of cowhide. It takes things like water and detailing very well. It's strong, it's thick, and it comes in a variety of thicknesses from like half a mil up to four or five millimeters. Um, when you get into the really heavy stuff, you can obviously make really good armor and whatnot around that. Suede, like this. I, but this is warm and it doesn't breathe, so don't line a coat with suede. Um, but you do obviously get that suede effect that you, uh, that you might be very aware of with, with leather. And hair on side stroke skins, the most controversial of the leather. Because if you wear this, certain Peter groups will throw paint at you. But uh, we've, I don't generally use a lot of hair on. We, de we definitely don't use furs because furs have become... You can buy really good alternative fake furs these days, but I don't personally think you can buy good fake leather, which is why I will always happily use leather. So uh, there's a lot of varieties, and they're kind of four of 
40. There's tons and tons of different. So if you go onto something like Tandy Leather, which is a popular European uh, leather sale shop, uh, you will find lots. But one thing to bear in mind with it, it is pretty expensive, or it can be. For example, a veg tan. This is like the piece I had to buy just to make this belt. Because this belt's 2.1 meters long, end to end, I had to buy a piece of leather that was 2.1 meters long. And they only come in 26 square foot, which was almost 300 pound to make one belt. But also, it means I've got a lot of leather left over, which I'll use for other things. But yeah, be paid, especially with tooling leather, to pay for them. So how do we cut leather? There are a variety of different ways. Who ever cut foam? No one's cut foam. Some people have cut foam, a couple of people, yeah. So when you're cutting foam, right, you generally cut it with a craft knife. You can cut leather with a craft knife. You get a ruler, you get your... I'm not gonna show you that because everyone knows how to use a knife, right? Has anyone ever cut their food before? Yeah? Yeah, you can do this then, great. Uh, if you've ever cut fabric with a rotary tool, Anyone use one of those round things? Has this got a beam on it? Mm, ah, yes. Yeah, great. If you've ever used one of those, so a rotary tool is basically it's like a pizza cutter, if you've ever used a pizza cutter, but the same. But you do have to be quite aggressive, especially when it comes to VegTown. Uh, the belt strap maker. This is the best tool. Most people haven't seen one. We're going to use one. That's this little thing. I'll come into that in a little more detail in a second. And my new favorite way of doing it, because I've just bought one, a laser cutter. Um, because you can get super detailed, super clean lines, um, but obviously you have to buy a laser cutter. So it depends how much investment you want to make into it. But they can be used for obviously then detailing and all that kind of stuff, but they do create very good and pretty finished edges straight away. But we're talking about making a belt. So this little thing, to give you a bit more detail, is there is a scale along this side. And that's how you decide how big your belt's going to be. Because here's a blade that every time I do this, I cut myself on. In fact, my finger's bleeding here because leather is dangerous, kids. Um, and you choose how wide you want your belt to be. So I'm going to make a belt that is, uh, just adjust this thing, move it to where I want, let's say four and a half centimeters, tighten it at the back. And then this thing here is ready to do some belt cutting. So if I was going to be doing it on this, now usually you would hope you've got one almost just tore through my coat. You would hope that you had one straight side already. Now, why is that tightened there? Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry, my blade is overly tight. Let me just uh, adjust this. If you'd like to just entertain yourselves for a moment. There we go, right. So sometimes that just gets a little bit tight. So usually you would make sure you have one straight long edge. And you want, the idea of this tool is that it's going to make a belt that is evenly widthed all the way along it. So you kind of just insert your leather into it and then pull it along one side. And you end up with a piece that is evenly widthed. Now, that's a bit crooked because it started a little bit crooked. And obviously it's followed the line. but. We're going to roll with it because I think in the end, it'll be fine. So this is like your belt cutting tool. So as you can see, it's dead quick and easy to get a nice straight cut edge that is evenly finished all the way along it. Be gone. Part two, oh, laser cutter again. Uh, shaping and wet forming. So what is, why do we wet form leather? <laughs> oh, here we go. So who likes science? The reason we wet form leather is because of science. Um, so um, leather is a, obviously a porous material. Um, it's not like plastic, so if you spill water on it, it just rubs off. Leather soaks water in. So if you get leather wet and then shape it and then let it dry, it'll retain its shape. So rather than you coming along and going, right, I need this thing to be like curved here and you hammer it a bit or you know, you've got your shape. Let's say you're using a, a large piece of leather and you shape it over something. And then, you, then later down the line, you're dyeing it or you're wetting it down the line. If you haven't wet it first, it'll soak that water in and expand and you'll lose all the detailing of everything. So you always, when you're forming and shaping leather around something, let's say you're doing 
boobs on a breastplate and you've shaped them over something, you need to make sure you wet it first because then it will retain that shape when down the line you come to actually start to finish the outfits. That's a small bit of science. Uh, edge grooving. So a lot, of, a lot of leather belts and pieces of armor. Obviously, I can see some uh, mastercrafted woven at the back there. Uh, they have sewing edges down the side of them. And it's sometimes quite difficult to make sure you keep the, the sewing edge even alongside the edge. So you know what it's like if you're trying to sew, say, a bias binding, and you're trying to keep your needle exactly two-eighths from the edge as you sew it. You know what that's like? Well, it's even worse when it comes to leather. So we have a tool here, and this is called an edge groover, not to scale. Um, so what this thing does is it has a little blade just on this inside edge. So right here, that's a little blade. And what the blade allows you to do is put the blade onto the leather, rest the actual edge of the leather against basically this point here, and then when you run it along the side, it'll create a groove, which then, I'm not going to wreck your table, I do promise, uh, which then will be prepared for, for sewing. So I'm going to try and do it where people might be able to see. So you just hold it like this, and then pull it down, and it takes a little bit out. This is going to be the most janky belt. It's going to be hilarious. It's going on eBay. So... Just to give you an idea, you can see a little groove there all the way down the edge. So now if I want to sew along a persistent line, I know exactly where my line is. So that's always going to be this distance from the edge. Now there is a little screw in the end, and if I had something to unscrew it, you can unscrew it and then move it in and out to get the width from the edge that you want. So you can make a tight edge or you can make a long edge. And there are some pieces that you'll use that will use two or three when they're being extra flamboyant. Um, but that's really good for that exact purpose. Who doesn't like being groovy? I mean, honestly, I have to use the most British, non-British man. So what's it for? Just told you. Beveling. This has nothing to do with Beverly Knight. Um, that joke has never landed. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so beveling. Who knows what beveling is in the ter any terms? No 3D modelers. No, great. That means I can sound really smart. Beveling is uh, when you take a square edge and make it rounded, or you at least clip the corner of it to make it a little bit more rounded. It's purely done for the aesthetic. It serves no, no purpose at all. I know you didn't expect this many memes, right? It's only going to get worse. So this tool, much like the the edge beveler, uh, the, the previous one, the edge beveler, uh, edge points to that man, the edge groover. That one you pull towards you, this one you push away from you. And it's got, again, a little blade just inside here. And the idea is here, you put it on the edge with the blade facing upwards, and you can just run it across the edge. And this, uh, this one can be a bit cursed. But again, you'll just take a little bit right off the very edge. Do, 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 do. I know this is amazing for those at the back, but <laughs> like, da, 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 da. right, there we go. So if we take a look, you might see that there's a very slight edge being kind of removed off the top, so like clipped it at 45 degrees. Now you can adjust the angle to get slightly different angles, should you wish, but that then helps for a later step that we'll get to in a bit where you can then start to uh, just make it look a little bit slicker around the edges. Now, some outfits and some styles will warrant this. If you're going for like more modern styles, definitely. Things like, um, when, if you're doing something like The Witcher or some Viking or historical stuff, you generally won't do this process because they would have had a more raw edge. So there's a few of the steps that we wouldn't do. But if you're doing kind of modern, well-finished, kind of really classy-looking leather work, and leather straps, that's a really good way of making it look a bit more classy. Swivel tie. Right, this is the best. And 
after we're done here, if anyone wants to come and try this, please come and do so because it is a lot of fun. Um, where's my swivel tool gone? There we go. Right. So this little thing that spins really quickly. Oh, I didn't put a picture of it up. I'm going to come in the middle here and hold this. So this is a little blade on the end here, and it rotates around this U-shaped thing. Everyone got a glimpse of what that is, and you can see the back here. Little U-shaped thing, turny bit, sharp bit. That's about all you need to know. So the idea of this is index finger on here, hold it here, and draw some pretty shapes. So if you were going to use it with something like a belt, again, you might not be able to see great, but we'll get there in a minute, is let's say you were going to do, let's say you're going to do this, this flower. So you would think about the two swooping lines and then how these bits are cut out into it. So what you do is you put the blade towards yourself and just go whoosh, like this. And then you, it's actually, you, as you do it, you move just with these two fingers and you rotate the belt, uh, rotate the swivel tool. And it doesn't have to be like super uh, deep or anything like that because that kind of step comes in the next stage. But what this is doing is preparing the pattern that you're going to do during the hammering stage. So in a minute we'll be getting hammered, but right now <laughs> we're doing the prep. So as you can see here, if I just show you, you can see that it's that little design, just in a couple of seconds, just gets quite easily dragged into it. Like I say, if you want to try this, please do, because it is very good. Though I do need to sharpen mine, because it's not quite as dangerous as it should be. So there, right. So this is the prep stage. This is a prep stage for where the fancy stuff comes in. I'm going to need my water. One, for drinking, and two, for demonstration purposes. That is fizzy. Actually, it'll work. Right. Sorry, let me just get rid of this because I'm about to make a mess. Oh, if you like making messes, you're in costuming. Leather is a good way of doing that. Also, if you like having permanently yellow, slightly jaundiced looking hands, leather work is great for that. So, leather hammering. I don't know why I'm aiming at that when the computer's over here. Hammer tools. So this is where the, the artistic flamboyancy comes into doing a, a, uh, a piece of any kind of leather work. So the way we do this is with... Oh, bloody hell. I forget how many of these I've got. One of these. One of these 20, 30-something patterning tools. So all of these are all very slightly different shapes sizes, patterns. That one's got a little flower on it. It's nice. That one's a butterfly. Never found a use for that one. Um, but a lot of the common ones are meant to do that. They're judging. Jeez. How many knees? Ooh. Oh, it's that one. Remember that one? God damn, we had problems with that one. Um, <laughs> when we were making the Ragnar and Lagatha that were in the opening slide, Lagatha's armor has this S-shape hole punched for all of the, the threading on it, and there's thousands of these holes. And we bought six of those punches or something like that? Three? Three? That's close. From, Amer from China and ruined them all in about 40 seconds. So we ended up, they were just crap. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, funny memories. So when you're going to start hammering this stuff, what you want to do is use your lines that you've just cut as a guide. So the idea is that's going to help you emphasize a high point and a low point, which is where you start to get these things here. So on this line, oh, oh, on this line, for example, fuck off, sorry, <laughs> edit that out. Um, this line, for example, They've hammered along one side of the line with a texturing tool. So what that has done is just opened up the, the opened up the, uh, the the cut line that we've just done a little bit. It opens it up, and it show, because you've got the high point and the low point, it starts to show that contrast. 
Now, one thing, like I mentioned earlier, is when you do this work, you need to do it wet. That's the leather, not you. Um, I mean, it is optional. If you want to shower in leather, be my guest. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. And you need a hammer. Now, if you've got like a sledgehammer, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, what I would recommend is one of these, because it's a leather hammer. Um, and this end bit is very slightly soft, but it will also be weaponized should you wish. Um, but it is slightly soft. Because it's slightly soft, it doesn't ruin whatever's underneath it, he says cautiously. No, it's fine. Don't worry. Just going to put this underneath it, though. Just in so when you buy a set of leather tools or equipment, often they come with a couple of slabs. So we've got like a marble slab. I generally put underneath when doing this process um, because, it, because it's really, really hard. It means, <laughs> it means when you're hammering down, whatever's underneath doesn't move at all. Um, so subsequently, all the pressure that you apply is applied downwards. So when you want to vary pressure, then um, you have the ability to do so. So you usually get like a marble slab and then a plastic slab that sits on top, which is when you want to punch holes through, but we'll go through that shortly. So if you're going to do this, like I say, you need to wet it first. So get a couple of fingers wet, try not to snigger, and then and give it a good rub in. Um, and you want to basically saturate the area that you're going to be hammering. So this is, this is my uh, pre-made leaf. It's the one I made earlier. And what I'm going to do is take this little tool, which is a small, slightly diagonal. So for those who can't see, there's a, like an angle like this along one edge. And the point of the angle is going to go against the line. So I'm going to be take, the line's going to be here. I'm going to be putting it against that line and just tap, 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 tap along one edge. So you want to make sure it's an angle where you can see what you're doing. And just use that ledge as a guide. Da, 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 da. Hi ho. And then you can just you know smooth it out with a couple of passes. Ta-da! I oh, know, thank you. Hold your applause. So that's one edge there, right? And it's small. It's small, but when you start to add the other things to it. <laughs> this is cursed. Who's done this to me? What a day. Right. Technology. So I'm going to do the other one, just in case you didn't see that first one. But I'm going to do it the other way around. So we've made kind of like this central groove. And the harder you hammer, the more likely you are you're going to smash up someone else's table. But um, <laughs> you can really vary the pressure. So you can put it on lightly, lightly. And you will make like a very, it's hard to see from the back. But as you're leaving, feel free to come and take a look at this stuff close up. So I've hit it hard at one end. And you can see a big, thick dent. And then the rest is tickly tickly, so you know it's as very slight and groove. So there's lots of times, for example, if you were to make like a flower or something like that here, you might vary the pressure. So you can see how that kind of goes from deep to not deep. You do that by varying the pressure as you as you do your uh, detailing in your leather. So we continue to do that. Let's say we've done that over all of this and made it look pretty. I don't have time for that now, unfortunately. Um, I, that would be the worst presentation, just sit here me watching me doing that. <sighs> Dying. So you've beautifully detailed your leather, but then you've let it dry. Important, because otherwise you're about to do bad things. Now, I have never traveled to another country with a thing of leather in my bag and it not broken open and dyed something in my bag, so I didn't risk it this time. So there will be no dying. I know, don't worry. We have got stuff to use in another section in the moment. But the important thing about dying is that there are a couple of ways of doing it. There's dumb ways to die. So there was a scrap that I intended to bring, but we don't have it, so we'll be leaving it alone. OK, so there's a, one good way of dying is with submission. Take that as you will. 
Um, so uh, what I mean by that is, so let's say you've got a large piece that you want to ensure that has a large a, a color consistency. So if you're going to dye fabric, you might have a big pot of water with your fabric dye in and you submerge it. Exactly the same with leather. A couple of things you have to watch out for. Your water to dye ratio don't want more than 50% water. Because if you do, you'll what's called oversaturate too much water in your leather. And when that reacts with the dye, you end up with this kind of gold, greenish shimmer that goes over the top of your dye, of your dye in your leather. So it basically gives it this kind of like cheap Lamborghini vibe, which you probably don't want. Um, not that there's cheap Lamborghinis, but. Um, uh, so, if you do make that mistake, because I've made that mistake dozens of times before, to my displeasure, um, it is possible to bring your leather back to life. You can give it a slight sanding or attack it with a little bit of isopropanol alcohol, acetone, um, nail varnish remover, that kind of stuff. It will take the edge off it, but you do risk ballsing up all of your work at the same time. So try and keep that, that ratio right. So what you do, you, generally speaking, you take your pot of dye, which will look something like that. I use Feebing's dye pretty much exclusively. It's very good and it's inexpensive. You can get it on Amazon next day, most places. Um, and yeah, you mix it with your water. And so I have a tub about yay big. So for example, when I was doing this, this was done with submission and the next step that we'll get to in a moment. So it was just a case of, you know, popping one side in, giving a little wiggle, keep popping it in, giving a little wiggle. <laughs> and that's it. And then you generally turn it over and do the same on the other side. Because <laughs> this is, this is going to live on the internet forever, isn't it? Um, you, one thing you have to be uh, careful with on that is if you only do it with the, so you generally with leather, you have a good side and a, I'm not bothered about this side, the back side. No one cares about the backside. So the backside is the furry side. And yeah, so if you've usually got a, a smooth front and a hairy back. Um, so if you do it with just the smooth, the working face upwards, you risk actually not soaking enough dye into the back so it doesn't pick up the color. <clears throat> so always give it a, an upside downer. Big point, wear rubber gloves when doing this because leather dye will ruin your hands for days. I've gone and honestly, I've looked jaundiced um, a, a variety of cons, especially when you're using browns. And blacks will just, it's just bad. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, not like, it's not like getting um, fabric dye on your hands. It will stain, and I mean it will hard stain. One of the big reasons why I didn't bring it with me, because if it got leaked in my bag in yellow, game over. So um, yeah, so that's submission. The other way is daubing, which is adorable. Um, oh, I did bring the thing, yes. Cool, that means the next step is better. Um, so daubs are basically that thing. Yes, thank you. So this is a little piece of wool on the end of a stick. And you dip it in the dye, and you rub it on with the dye. And that's it, it's like a paintbrush for, for leather. And because it saturates all the leather in, you can hold quite a lot, and you can spread it down. So you don't use something like a paintbrush, you use one of these instead. Um, predominantly because the paintbrush won't soak the dye in. You know, when you're using paint, paint sits on the sits on the brush because it's got a higher viscosity. Because this is almost like water, you need something that can physically soak it. So that's why you use one of these. If you want to be cheap and not use one of these, though they usually come free with one of those boxes, <clears throat> you can use a bit of material. Like I like using cutoffs of suede for a similar reason. So they work quite similarly. So you can you know, saturate it into here. But daubers are the best, and you can buy them in like boxes of 50 for a couple of local currencies. Um, uh, yeah. Die, die, die. He's using a brush, though, so. Antiquing. Make the fresh look old and detailing from a distance. Right, so antiquing we will do. So antiquing is the process of then making, you've, you've, let's say you've hammered in some beautiful detailing, you've done your submission dyeing, but it's all one color. So you put it up on the wall or from a distance, and you're, you know, you're having your photographs taken, and it just looks a little bit flat. You can't see that detailing. What antiquing does is basically it's the 
It's the um, rinse weathering, paint weathering of leather. You use a antiquing gel available in a load of flavors. Colors, flavors? <laughs> Don't drink it. <laughs> so it's got a childproof lid, so naturally I can't get into it. And the difference between this stuff, as you'll see now, is it's thick. It's thick and goopy. Now, it can be applied with a dauber, but I pretty much only use suede cutoffs for this. Um, so the idea is, much like when you're doing you know, um, any weathering that you might be doing on a prop, you take the thing and you just rub it in and just keep it moving, and then it will start. Like you can see there immediately, even with that tiny little bit of, of uh, indentation, that it sits in the indentation, but because you're rubbing it with a flattish surface, it sits in those grooves, so you start to add some depth and some texture into your leather. Now, that will do it a lot more than weathering will do. So it does a couple of things, really. I'm gonna rub that off there before I sit on it or something equally cursed given how this, detail from a distance, um, yeah, okay. Um, and it will also, um, it gives a really nice finish because it gives a slight gloss. Um, now you can get matted ones, but mostly, like most of these, the eco flows, for example, <coughs> are very slightly gloss and it will give a slight edge to it. So for example, the belt I'm wearing was submission dyed and then you may or may not be able to see because it's supposed to be really subtle, there are, Lines and lines and lines of little dots and pattern pieces on this. Should you be so interested, it is screen accurate, of course. Um, and uh, they were all done with a paint pen, but it was a just off-white, like an ever so slightly cream paint pen. <laughs> you see me after class? <laughs> Thank you. Got homework. Um, <laughs> um, so, you made me lose my train of thought now. What were we saying? Paint pen, thank you. Uh, so I was using the paint pen, um, but it, it was, because it was just off white, slightly cream, it was quite bright. And I didn't want, obviously, for Oberon to have a really bright, detailed piece. So I did a pass with the, the like this one, over the top of the other thing, and it just took the edge off, and it gave the like, slight bit of, slight bit of um, shine to it, just made it look like a nice, finished piece. So that's the antiquing gel. Um, again, available in as many colors as the dyes are, your reds, your blues, your golds, um, and again, not horribly expensive. Mainly, the tools and things aren't all that costly, so you can get a 60-piece leatherworking toolkit off Amazon for 30 quid. That's one month, how, I can't remember the conversions. A thousand? A thousand. About just no, best, less than that, about 850. Um, but it's the leather that you pay for. The tools aren't, aren't all that bad. Um, same like the dyes and the burnishes and all that kind of stuff aren't that bad either. So burnishing is this. So when you've got your cut leather piece, you've got the edge, the raw edge. And it's like having an unhemmed seam. Now, for a lot of costumes, actually having that is perfectly fine because if you're doing, say, something from historic that has historical accuracy, they wouldn't generally have burnished unless uh, they were trying to figure a, a certain style. Ugh, this is the fanciest burnishing tool because it's in its own private little box. And it really isn't that fancy. Just my auntie gave me this for Christmas and she wanted to box it up. So in here we have a piece of beeswax. That's as simple as burnishing is, is you use beeswax. So it's a combination of tools, actually. Burnishing and then one of these variety of tools. So this is a circular burnisher. It's a piece of wood with a groove in it. Or you might have one that looks like this. So it's got a pointed edge, which you'll, God, what's with my hands? And then a variety of grooves in here with different thicknesses. My go-to one is this round one, which is pretty much the same, but it's 360 degrees. So what you'll be doing for burnishing is to basically give it this finished edge. So stop it looking 
like an unfinished seam and start having something a bit more of a slick finish, like so. Um, and in order to do this, we get the beeswax, rub it on the side. Do, 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 do. It looks a lot better when it's been dyed beforehand. Um, you rub it on the side, and then you take one of these tools, and this is the fun bit, it's like cardio. Guys will be better at this generally. <laughs> Yeah, so you continue like that for basically for a, a few seconds, you know, 15, 20 seconds is all it takes. Um, and that will start to slick that edge. So what it's doing in a science way is taking the beeswax and you're jamming it into the leather. And the, the leather is soaking up that beeswax and, start, and when you start to rub it, the application of heat starts to melt the wax around the edge and seals it. So if you're going to do this, you have to do this after you dye, because, like, dye the leather. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you won't then be able to dye the leather, because you will have protected it. And that's what this is really for. It's two things, really. It's the aesthetic, and it's to protect the edge of the leather. It makes it a bit stronger, means that materials don't seep into it, and it means that the leather itself keeps its shape for longer, which is great. Um, so, yeah, you can just do that. Like, so it doesn't take long. This entire belt I did in my lunchtime on Tuesday, no, Monday this week. So it took about an hour to do the entire belt. And it's, like I say, 2.1 meters long. Um, so it doesn't take all that long. But, like I say, it's actually quite cathartic if you enjoy just sitting there doing that for an hour. Um, but it does give you a really nice finish. Punching and sewing, right. So we've made a little groove line down the sides that we intended to put some sewing into, but as of yet, haven't done it. Now, I will admit, I would probably do this before dying, because it's funny every time. Um, if you do this after you've done the dyeing, then you, if you could end up with a lot of little holes, and the dye isn't in the little holes. So if you've not sewn in it in a way, or you might see a little bit of the original, di uh, the original leather color in that hole, it's unlikely, but it's generally something I would do earlier in the process. But you do have a variety of tools that we can do this next step with. Um, they are predominantly hilariously named. Um, <clears throat> so where is my throng punch? I didn't bring my throng punch. OK, I've got like 20 of them. Right, OK, I'll show you a couple of other things first. They are these little spiky wheels. Um, it looks like a weapon that you would see on Robot Wars. Um, there is a third one here somewhere, because I know, because I just stabbed myself with it. There it is. So these things all fundamentally do the same thing. They tell you where you're going to sew your holes. It just so happens that this is six millimeters between each spike. That one's five, and that one's four. So it depends what you want to do. So you would then take this tool, put it in your little line, and walk it forwards. And you don't have to use much pressure. Just follow your line. Da, 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 da. Obviously, use a little bit more care than that. And you'll end up, we'll go here, with a little dotty line, you might just be able to see here, that shows me where I'm going to then go on to the next step, which is the, the owling. Nothing to do with owls. It's owl with an A, or all. So you see the little dotty line? It's just basically a sewing guide. So then we come to the nice danger piece. We can use an owl, an all, or an owl, depending on your accent or how posh you are. Um, so what is a throng punch first, actually? A throng punch is this. This is a throng punch. It's a series of holes, a series of spikes in a variety of distances. So if you don't want to do the step I'm about to do, this is actually much easier. So you would take one of these throng punches, stick it in your groove, and hammer it. And it would go through your leather, through your table, you'd lose your deposit. 
Um, no, this is when you would have the rubber, so the plastic mats that I was on about that you get on with the marble one, you would then throw one of these, that underneath, and then it would just go into the rubber mat, and you therefore wouldn't lose your deposit. Um, and these come in a variety of widths of sizes, so I've got some at 6 mil and 5 mil, and I think I've got them down to 2 mil, which is for the worst kind of leather sewing that you're ever going to do at 2 millimeters apart. So if you're going to use this, you would stick the, the, the four in, Heather it, let, bash it through, pull it out, and then you'll put prong number one in the hole that prong number four just made and do it again. So you create three new holes, but you then it, you don't end up with a it, slight distance issue in between four and one. It just helps you keep things consistent. So if you're doing long lines, you use the largest one of these you can. So I've got one that's, I think, eight prongs wide, which is the largest. And then my smallest is a single prong, which it never gets any use. But... Otherwise, you can get them from two all the way up to about eight. And when you buy them, you do buy them, for example, as a five millimeter separation pack, and you'll get a one through to a six usually, and they're all five millimeters apart. So you could kind of choose the use. So you can get constant versus offset patterns. So if you're going to do a sewing pattern that is two millimeter, well, four millimeters shown, four millimeters not shown, Four millimeters shown, four millimeters not shown. You're using a constant pattern. So you can just use one of these and away. But if you're going to do something like an offset pattern, for example, when I was making the Witcher armor, the uh, details across the front have a five millimeter show and then a four millimeter gap. Five millimeter show, four millimeter gap. So you obviously can't use one of them, but you can. So what you end up doing then is using, say, a five millimeter throng punch hammer it, and then you have to move it, measure it to six millimeters, hammer it again, move, uh, and it's a pain, which is why my witcher armor took 800 hours to make. Um, but it was also why it looked boss. Um, thread types. So the, oh, I, I'll put a step there, but it's kind of missed a step. So if you're going to use the throng punching method, you'd hammer that, and you'd end up with a load of holes. If you want to do it in another method, which is the kind of like take the stress of your enemies out method, um, you, and you end up with all these little holes here, and you've got one of these incredibly sharp spiky things, what you just do is then you're going to go right, die, die, and you just jam it through the holes, and keep going until all your stresses are alleviated, <laughs> and your hand is dead. So you just kind of just punch it through. And it's you know the same as using any really sharp thing that you stab through something. I'm sure lots of you have practice of that. Um, so you can do the same method. And again, if you wanted to do some kind of weird offset pattern or you wanted to do, say you wanted to do a zigzag pattern or something crazy, this is a good way of doing it. Because then you can you know just one at a time do the holes. But these tools, these or owls, they come in a variety of types. So that's a circular, just a point with like a two and a half-ish millimeter wide stick. This one is actually more like a blade. For those at the front, you can probably see it's, it's about four millimeters wide in the middle. But then if you turn it 90 degrees, it's about a millimeter wide. So it's like a, well, the wider blade. So instead of getting a hole, you get like a slash. So that's good if you really want to fuck someone up. Um, so that's the other option you do. And then you're going to think, well, how am I going to thread it? Now, Witcher stuff is notorious for putting top stitches on things just for the sake of it, because it looks cool. And you can do that with a lot of armor stuff. It just gives you that extra, extra level of embellishment, the extra level of fanciness. So you can use lots of different types. You could use standard you know, threading, um, threading um, thread. Uh, you could use that, or you could, you know, so if anyone's ever used that, what's that stuff called? And it has like eight threads in it, and you buy it in a little roll, and it's in about a thousand colors. That's really good, because it's quite thick. But what I like to use is leather thread, funnily enough. Um, so this is waxed leather thread, which means, ow, it's strong. So that's not going to go anywhere. So what you would definitely use this for is if you're ever getting to the point of, say you've, not wanted to buy a two meter wide piece of leather, 
and you've wanted to actually say, oh, actually, I'll just buy a one meter wide piece, but I need a two meter wide belt, so you've got to stitch a couple of bits together. You use this stuff and when you're stitching pieces of leather together, and it is not going to go anywhere. Now, you would sew it much like you sew any... Nope. Uh, I wondered if I had an extra slide. You would sew it much like you sew any thing through leather, uh, through any material, and that's with needles. So you can buy lots and lots of different types of leather needles. This is a slash needle because it's got a, like a cool stabby bit on the end and a slight twist. I've never known why that like slight bit is in there, but there it is. Um, you can buy lots of needles that are just like regular needles, um, you know, perfectly straight, but with a slightly larger hole because they need to obviously be able to get the thick leather wire through there. The thing that is going to cause you mountains of pain, and I can tell you this because I've experienced it a lot, and I don't have a regular needle, is getting it through the leather. Because if you've ever tried to say so through eight bits of fabric, or you try to put that through your machine when you're doing a hem, and the machine just goes, Ugh! that's going to be your hands. Um, and it's fine, you know, you kind of get used to it, but God invented the thimble for a reason. Um, so when you're doing it, God, I don't have the, that's so disappointing in myself. So let's imagine I'm saying, right, get a thimble, because you will need it to jam it through, because it is quite tricky, and it can be quite stiff. Um, so the other big thing I would recommend is get a pair of marigolds, some rubber gloves, because when you're trying to push it, you can generally get it part of the way through, and then if you're wearing rubber gloves, you get really good grip, So, because otherwise if your hands get sweaty and you try to pull the needle through from the other side, you can't do it. So if you get some like washing up gloves, pull it through, and you're away, and you can sew your, your, your leather, and that's sewing 101. Come back later for my sewing workshop. No, I don't have one. Uh, finishing. Okay, so there are varieties of things that you can do when you're finishing, and it completely depends on what you're trying to do with your leather, whether it's um, a piece of armor or a belt. So, for example, here, this is riveting, not the conversation, the action. <laughs> that joke lands better in the UK. Um, uh, so, riveting, if we're going to rivet, a belt or, you know, if, for example, if you're making a belt, you need to have where your, your prong of your belt goes through, so your little holes. So generally speaking, you can use one of these standard hole punchy type jobs, or you can get one of these things. So this is just a metal shaft with a hole in it, um, and it has replaceable ends, and these ends are, generally speaking, interchangeable with these, they just screw on. But then you can buy these packs. So I've got about 40 in here, a variety of sizes. Um, so they go from very, very thick, which you would use for belts, through to very small. And much like a bunch of, I'm gonna be really careful here that I don't do anything bad. But you would just place this where you want to place it, where you're gonna make your hole, and I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna do any harder than that. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm not going to get through this because I don't dare, um, because you do need to give it a bit of a whack to get through. But the reason this thing has a hole and a groove in the side is you will obviously take a chunk out of the leather, and that chunk will end up in the end of here, and then over time they'll come up and they'll fall out the side of the hole, so it doesn't get jammed up. So you can then start to use these, and then you might use something like a riveter, or a riveting tool, as we've got here, so I don't know if anyone's ever used rivets. Or have you all just used googly eyes and painted them gold and pretended that they're rivers? I know what you do. I've seen it. So, so um, yeah, so this is a, it's a piece of metal with four different sized concave holes in it. So you would use this for riveting. Um, uh, so, you know, you put your rivets through, find the right size hole, put it on the back of your rivet, flip, bash, done, rivets. Um, so there's a couple of ways that you might use that for a belt. I'm not going to take this one off because all my clothes will fall apart. But um, behind here, there are a couple of rivets in the back. So where you've got the belt buckle, you kind of get to the end. And then we need the belt buckle here. So you fold it, create the holes here, 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 here. And then you can rivet through it. 
Now, obviously, if you go and have a belt buckle, especially if it's not metal, you need to be careful you don't hammer the buckle because you will break the buckle. And I've done that in the many a time. And the worst thing is when you end up with a broken buckle, but your rivets are in, so then you can't do anything because you have to break up all your rivets, which is a pain, but it's perfectly doable. Um, so you might do things like riveting, pot fasteners. Um, you know, it, sometimes I've done things where I've done all the sewing, but then the sewing looks really bright. And so you want to weather it down. So you might use like a dirty down or a, another layer of an antiquing gel or something like that just to take a bit of the edge off the, off the, uh, the thread and just make it a little bit less angry. So, any questions? At the back, hello. For the riveting, generally it depends. I generally just use steel rivets or brass. Depends on the aesthetic. Oh, for this? Yeah, it's just a piece of steel. Yeah, you buy that from the shop. Um, it's called a rivet tool. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's called a riveting tool. Um, no. The whole point is because it's concave, the rivet sits inside it. So even if it does distort a little bit, so long as you've used the one that's closest to the actual size of the rivet, it doesn't actually distort it. It kind of just cradles it consistently. So if you don't do that, you end up with either a flat rivet on one side, because when you're hammering it, you will generally end up with a flat rivet on the back, which is fine. Um, but if you, yeah, you don't use one of these, you end up with a flat rivet on the front, which is sometimes fine. Sometimes you want the flat rivet look, um, in which case, put it on a piece slab of something hard, like um, marble or something, hit it down, get your flat end. But it completely depends on the look that you're going for. But yeah, this thing is just a little steel block. If it was aluminium, you would knacker it like, quite quickly. Yeah, some rivets come with speciality ones. So again, when we were making Maria's Lagather outfit, it has these domed rivets, and they're like a half of a ball. So if you try to use any general rivet, um, tool on them. It will flatten them or misshape them. So they, you then buy speciality ones. So you get, for example, called a dome rivet. Uh, uh, sorry, a dome rivet tool, which is a half ball shape. And then you buy it for the right size. So you could get three mil or five mil in that specific size. Um, so yeah, making sure you've got the right tool for the right rivet is quite important. But that can be in another class about rivets. Um, yeah. Anyone else got any questions? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. No. No heat. No heat's required because the actual movement and the friction causes enough heat to melt the wax anyway. Yeah. Science, right? Um, one thing to note is that in one of these tools, you'll see probably only the two on the right here have been used because I used quite thick leather. So. Um, imagine um, you've got a, a flat edge, right? If you want the, uh, a very, very slight nick in the edges, you would use the larger one because it's the gradient's less. But if you want quite an aggressive curve to it, you would use a slightly smaller one closer to the width of the leather because then it will give you a more aggressive rounding. So the only difference is you need with these. But yeah, the, the friction makes it warm. Like when you do it, you can then feel it, and you feel it's ever so slightly warm just for a few seconds. But that's enough to melt the... The, um, the beeswax. But there's another way of doing the burnishing, which is using a product called gum tracanth, which no one will remember, so it's fine. Um, but it's a thing that you use when you're making like, little models for cakes. It's like, a, um, it's like a powder. You buy it in a powder. You get it from any like, supermarket kind of place. Um, and yeah, you use it for making cake and icing models. But you make it 24 hours in advance, and you get this like putty. It's like a gum. That's why it's called gum tracanth, really. And you can use that to slick as well. And it's a bit cheaper than beeswax, and it's perfectly good. But I like doing things historically. So, you know, if we're doing something like this, it's literally some beeswax, a bit of animal skin, and a piece of wood. Like, it's so natural. And I like, love the fact that, you know, 2,000 years ago, they were doing this exact same thing with the exact same tools and getting the exact same results. And it's something that's persisted, and I really like that about it. Yeah? Anything else? Yes. Not anything. <laughs> but you wouldn't be the first. Um, yes, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, for anyone who's got any questions, feel free to take one of my cards. 
Um, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, uh, and we've recent we've we've not been able to do it recently, but we've we tried to do Twitch streams as well, showing off like different skills. We were doing it a couple of times a week, and it's a bit tailed off a bit. But I'd like to start doing some more of those. And I have a YouTube channel, but it's mainly 3D modeling and 3D printing tutorials. So if you're into that stuff. I have a YouTube channel full of that stuff, but all the details are on the business card. Well, actually, just Instagram is on there, but you can find the rest through Instagram. I know I'm getting a long way around to the, the right answer. But yes, I, I generally try to answer as many questions as I can. Time dependent, obviously. You know, don't, don't expect one in two hours, but 24 is quite feasible. And that's, oh, sorry, one second. Uh, I, um, my very first cosplay, I did Ezio from Assassin's Creed, and um, it has this, the long cape, and it's got the, like, the leather thing over the shoulder, and I made it in a fake leather, and I thought, this looks crap. So I went and bought some real leather, and I just got obsessed with working with leather, and I just, pretty much every costume I've made, bar a couple, have had some leather element to them since then. And it's just like... Like, I started with some rackety old sewing machine, and now I've got a fancy sewing machine. And just over the years, I bought, like, an entry-level pack for about 20 euros of leather tools, and then I've added to them over the years, as I've needed more things. Um, but there's, you know, I, I learn everything I've learned, I've learned from YouTube, which is it's basically this. It's someone sitting in front of you going, here's how to burnish your thing in four minutes. And, you know, you can just watch one of those. There's nothing you can't learn on the Internet anymore. So, yeah, that's how I got into it, just from necessity and wanting to work with it. And I just really enjoy it as a material. It's predictable. It's not like Warbler. Warbler, you put a bit of heat on it. It's like, I don't know what I want to do. Whereas leather, you know, you put heat on it, you put water on it, and once you've used it a couple of times, you know what it's going to do and it's predictable, and you can therefore make some really nice things with it. And it's very versatile. So if you're going from thick veg tan leather like this through to garment leather or suede or hair on sides, they all have slightly different uses. But as you get used to using a variety of different leathers, you find you can use them for a lot of things. And uh, yeah, they look really nice, I think. Yeah. So you're, sorry, one. Hardening leather, um, uh, no. I've never needed to, really. I, I, the only times I've needed to do it, I have some greaves that I use for my Geralt. Um, sorry, not greaves, gauntlets. And um, they needed to be hard. So I lined them with steel, um, which isn't really hardening the leather, but it achieved the same purpose. Um, but it does mean I can actually stop a sword should I ever be attacked um, as Geralt. Uh, which is unlikely, but um, yeah, there's, there's sheet metal on the inside, and then it's riveted to the sheet metal. Um, but no, um, but I'm sure the internet has any answers you would like about hardening leather. Um, yeah. Uh, you were talking about uh, oversaturating the water with yes. water, but uh, how do you know when the water is uh, wet? Uh, oh, when the leather is uh, wet enough uh, to keep the shape. So generally speaking, when you're, when you're wetting the leather to shape it, you can't oversaturate it. The problem is when you're oversaturating it with dye. So it's the mix of dye versus, and water together that reacts badly with the dye in the leather. So when you're shaping, and so let's say, let's say I was shaping this box, right? And what you would generally do is you get your leather pretty wet. You know, I would, I would submerge it and I would make it like soaked wet. Then you would put it on your thing and you might like hammer it around. I'm not going to do it because I'm going to mess up my box. But you know, you can then make, make a groove in it or you can shape it around things and it will actually take shape really nicely. So for example, if I was to get a large piece and put it over here, it w you could get it like into the grooves and you could actually get it to shape and it will stretch slightly when you get it wet because of the fact that it's porous and the water, the way the water reacts with it, you can get it to stretch over things. Actually quite take quite a lot of detailing. Don't know why I'm that. Um, so yeah, when you, that's the only time you have to worry about oversaturation is when it's with dye, not when you're actually just saturating it for shaping. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, mine. Um, no, it's just it's um, it's dyed with a, some of that leather dye that we saw on the leather dye slide. The fieldings in a colour called Cordovan, which is like a slightly reddish dark brown. And then it was detailed, and then it was just a layer, of, one layer of that over the top after the detailing, and that was it. And then burnishing. Yeah. Go. Oh. One sec. 
Good question. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Ragnar had um, 675 meters of leather cord in it. Let's go back to the start. Almost there. <laughs> this thing, every single one of these is leather. There are 387 rings. The actual original creator of this messaged me, or the one who created the original one for Vikings, messaged me, telling me he considered it perfect, which I'll take. Um, but that had the most leather in by a long shot. In fact, there's a funny story about this. Is there's, a, there's a raven here, which you can't see. But there's a pattern. You might be able to see a pattern here. So every ring goes bottom left to top right, bottom left top right, bottom left top right in the weaving pattern, and then alternate on the next row. So they alternate, except for just sat above the raven here. There's three rings which go the wrong way. And I had these high-definition reference images. And I saw they went the wrong way. I was like, do I do them the wrong way, or do I do them the right way? So I did them the wrong way. And then when he contacted me, I said to him, oh, by the way, why are these rings the wrong way? He goes, what do you mean? And I said, these rings, I showed him the reference image. He's like, oh, God, you've ruined it. So I ruined his own work. Um, but that one has by far the most leather. That's leather. This whole thing is made out of garment leather. It's leather trousers. It's pretty much entirely leather. It was warm. It was warm, to say the least. Um, I've just been flashed an end card over there, so I'm going to have to finish it there. But if anyone does have any questions, feel free to grab me afterwards. I'm going to go. Actually, I'm going to go for dinner now, unfortunately. But thank you very much for coming along. If you've got any questions, I've got business cards. Feel free to contact me. Cheers. You may now leave. <laughs> <Excuse me. laughs>